the eighth house sign of death and loss, with failing flame of yester's bright, as nature sheds her weary dross, escaping to immortal light. The waters of the Styx flow by, as Chiron's boat awaits each call. Yet weep not opal tears, nor sigh, for all who live must surely fall. The doors ajar to light the way, for joyous spirits soaring high. Farewell to shells of worn-out clay, for freedom gained is not to die. The judgment of the meek or wild, it matters most they did their best. As gentle G reclaims each child, and Chittagruba marks its test. In fearful depths of Hades' realm, where bones lie cold in Pluto's bed, a lustful Mars now takes the helm to stir the flame and raise the dead. The cycle joins at Halloween, as ageless mysteries work their right. All time is now for souls unseen. The quick, the dead, as one, unite. The Right of Scorpio When the sun has entered the sign of Scorpio, it is time to prepare your altar. Light the candle and sit down in your chair. This rite starts with a period of contemplation upon transformation. Bring the mind to consider the manifest and its many forms and realize that this world and everything connected with it is subject to change. Plants, animals, human beings, stars and planets all have a beginning and an apparent ending. Change occurs because the forces of the unmanifest which bring everything into being are constantly creating new life forms. Therefore, the world of form as we perceive it is the unreal, however solid it may appear, and the unseen energies of the unmanifest are the real and exist continually. Matter or form is an illusion, and in the East it is called maya, meaning illusion. Matter is transitory and is an inconstant process of renewal. It is the veil of the unmanifest through which the miracle of life is wrought. All life forms have rhythms of life, death and rebirth. The only difference is in the length of the life span. Our position in the scheme of things enables us to view both the partial life of a star and the life of a microbe with equal facility. This is not to say that the extent of our vision encompasses the whole of existence. What is seen through telescope and microscope is but a fragment of something quite beyond our comprehension. In the month of October and the sun's passage through the sign of Scorpio, the energies of the vegetable kingdom are being withdrawn and returned to their source, the unmanifest world. This action is shown in the glyph of Scorpio. Thoughts turn towards the mysteries of life and death and to those who have shuffled off this mortal coil. It is a time when the veil between the worlds becomes very thin indeed. Hence a time when communication with loved ones who have gone before is possible or more easily accomplished than at other times of the year. The festival of Samhain or Halloween which lies in the center of Scorpio is the celebration of the dead and reveals that our ancestors were fully aware of the implications concerning this time of the year. They lived their lives in harmony with the nature year and through their knowledge of the zodiac. Gaze steadily above the flame of the candle, then close your eyes and begin your visualization.
The stone slab you are leaning against is ice cold to your back. It is late evening and the mist hangs low over the ground. There is dampness everywhere and you recognize the faint smell of rotting vegetation. A light drizzle begins to fall and drops of moisture trickle from your hair and find their way down your neck, making you shiver. The dampness is seeping into your body, so you stand up, easing cramped limbs. As you do so, your feet strike a stone bar and you realize that this place is an old graveyard. You have been sitting upon a grave with the headstone at your back. The mist hangs like a grey pall and somewhere, far off, an owl hoots mournfully. The tombstones lean drunkenly at awkward angles and the box-like bulk of tombs, their capstones broken, gape like cavernous mouths. What a forsaken place! The remains of a path threads its way through the graves, and you follow it, the long grass tangling and pulling at your feet. A church bell chimes the hour, its tone muffled and flat in the mist. Surely this path leads somewhere. Suddenly your feet find a flagstone, and you step onto a broad path where yew trees almost meet overhead. Here the going is easier and you are able to make out the way ahead. Your clothing is now thoroughly wet and clinging coldly to your limbs. What would you give to be soaking in a hot bath? A rustling turns your head and your heart thumps uncomfortably. But the grey curtain merely reveals the black fingers of crosses pointing to the sky. Your foot meets a clump of moss growing between the stones and you almost go down. Recovering, you peer ahead and discern a small glimmer of light in the distance. Hurrying now, the light hangs steadily and becomes brighter. Of course, the church, every graveyard has one. The mist thins to reveal crumbling stone walls and a door where a lantern hangs. Your trembling fingers find a rusty iron ring. You turn it and push. The door yields reluctantly. Inside the pitch blackness is all enveloping and you can only stand, mustering your courage. The smell of dank, fetid air assails your nostrils and you long to turn and run, but you do not. As your eyes become accustomed to the interior, you can just see the high windows where a greyness hovers, as if it too hesitates to enter. Your mind springs to life again, of course, the lamp outside. Slipping through the door, you take the lantern from its hook and holding it high, you re-enter the church. The main body of the building lies to the right, the dusty pews queuing one behind the other. But now you see another door straight ahead and this one is slightly ajar with broken steps leading down into more murky darkness. It takes all your courage not to drop the light and run anywhere. Even the silent graves are preferable at this moment. But something holds you to your quest. Have you come this far to allow fear the upper hand? Surprisingly, this door opens easily as if on newly oiled hinges and gripping the lantern for dear life, you begin the descent. The stairway winds like a corkscrew, but the bottom is reached without mishap. 
the light reveals an arched passage and glancing up you encounter two green glittering eyes watching your every movement from a recess in the wall. Sudden fear gnaws in your belly as the snake, disturbed from sleep, hisses its annoyance, the forked tongue darting as if to smother the flame. Unable to move, you stare at the shining undulations working and furling rhythmically. Then swiftly it moves down the wall and vanishes into the darkness. Your heart steadies and carefully you continue along the narrow way. The passage opens into a large crypt. Stone pillars support the roof and run into arches above your head. A bat careers wildly past your outstretched arm, startled by the intrusion. What now? Timidly you move through the columns and suddenly your face is against a soft, velvety material. This curtain apparently cuts the crypt in half. Pulling feverishly at the cloth, you feel for an opening and find one. Then you gasp and cry out with relief. There is light beyond the screen, much light. Tall standing wrought iron candlesticks, each holding as many as nine candles, encircle a rough hewn stone altar. The glowing light and gentle heat draw you inside this haven. A brazier gleams red in a corner, and from the hot coals, the sweet smoke of incense spirals upwards. The snake lies coiled upon the altar, the green and gold skin reflecting the candlelight. Within its coils stands a plain wooden cup and a platter of bread. The calming effect of this temple destroys any apprehension and involuntarily you kneel, allowing its ambience to wash over you. How long you stay like that, you are not sure, but there is an unwillingness to let the moment slip away. The sound of approaching footsteps brings you to your feet and you look around for a place of concealment. An alcove provides dark shadow and you shrink back against the stone wall. The footsteps halt and you hear a door open and close. Whoever the visitor is, he or she is now in the temple and only a few feet from your hiding place. Holding your breath, you peer cautiously round the edge of the wall. A cowled and robed figure stands before the altar, and as if your presence is already discerned, it drops the cowl and turns in your direction. Fear not, I will not harm you. The tone is grave, yet holds a slight hint of amusement. The features are those of an elderly man, and he is smiling kindly. His white hair hangs over the dark robe, but surprisingly his folded hands hold the suppleness of youth. Slowly you emerge and stand defiantly, a hand gripping the cool metal of a nearby candlestick. I did not know who or what to expect, you explain lamely. I know, child, I know. It has been quite an arduous adventure, has it not? He nods understandingly. Still, you have overcome the test. You have not faltered, and that is good. You wonder about him. His straight, upright carriage belies his apparent age, and he carries himself with great dignity. My name is not important, child, but all come to know me sooner or later. May I offer you the cup? Like others you have met on these adventures, this person knows what you are thinking. He moves to the altar and lifts up the cup. Drink! The well-formed fingers caress the vessel lovingly, and in a moment you have taken it, your lips closing on the rim. 
You are not at all sure what kind of fluid you are drinking. One second it tastes like water, the next like wine, and now like milk. It is the moon's liquid and entirely magical. Again he answers your thoughts. You thank him and he replaces the cup. Will you also consume some bread? He offers the platter and you suddenly realize how hungry you are. The bread is extremely wholesome and you busily crunch three pieces. And that was very good. Thank you. He returns the platter to its position upon the altar and gently strokes the snake's smooth head. This altar is one of the oldest in the world. It and others like it are dedicated to the Magna Mater, the Great Mother. In Egypt and elsewhere, temples to the gods were raised upon an underground sanctuary such as this. You will visit one of them in another journey. He motions for you to sit down and you sink onto a small footstool. The Great Mother is the giver and the receiver. She gives life and she also takes life. They who believe in the Great Mother are her especial children. They, unlike those who know her not, are guided in life and also in their rebirth. Most of mankind are orphaned of the Mother the vital link has been severed. To believe that divinity is wholly male is an error and moreover an insult to the source of life. By denying the feminine in religious thought, a blockage occurs on all levels, spiritual, emotional and physical. As a consequence of this bereavement, the individual often senses that something is wrong something is missing and he or she may attempt to correct this state of affairs by following beliefs other than their own always hoping to be healed to be made whole again and again they are disappointed until they find the great mother in their travels in recognizing the goddess nothing is lost because she immediately reveals her opposite, her complementary counterpart, her consort and lover, Pan, the virile god of nature. From these two come all other gods, mostly watered down versions of the originals, and therefore pallid ghosts in comparison. Now I will show you something. He moves behind the altar and you follow obediently. A small door is hidden in the shadows and your companion opens it. Steps lead down to a broad river where a large black barge is moored. The water is an inky blue-black and reflects a thin waning moon. This is the river of the moon, and all are taken to the other side. The ancient Greeks knew it as the Styx, the river of the dead. He looks into your face. But fear not, death is not the end, rather is it a new beginning. Who are you? The question springs unbidden to your lips. He gazes into the distance. I have many names. I was Thanatos to the ascetic Greeks, Sika Osiris to the ancient Egyptians, the Dagda to the Celts, yet I am also the Transformer, taking bodies and regenerating them, giving a new life. He grins disarmingly and looks almost boyish. Is that so very terrible? You grin back and shake your head. No, I am glad that I have met you at this time. By what name may I call you? How about Nicholas? Will that do? 
you nod in agreement, and he takes your hands between both of his and closes his eyes. A feeling of great power and strength surges through your entire body. It feels like being lit up from within, as though you had touched the fount of life itself. Then Nicholas draws you back inside. You must go back. Now. Strangely, there is a reluctance on your part. I hope you will return from time to time and bring others with you. Perhaps upon the next solar return to Scorpio. You agree happily and he leads you out of the temple. Along the passage and up the winding steps to the door of the church. You wave Nicholas goodbye and walk slowly back through the graveyard. The fog has lifted and a sheet of sunlight bathes the place in brightness. Without any difficulty, you find the spot where you began this journey and sit down. Your gaze is drawn to a clear sky where an eagle soars on powerful wings, silhouetted against the azure vault of heaven. It circles once, then is gone. And at last, the vision fades. Take a little to eat and drink and give thanks before the altar. A candle must be left burning throughout the night to symbolize the immortality of the soul and as a remembrance of Nicholas. <laughs>